back in the garage again and I'm back onto the S1000RR engine project. So last time I was here I'd already got the crankcases put together so I fitted the clutch and the oil pump and some of the bottom end parts. This time I'm going to fit the cylinder head but before I do that I'm going to check the squish clearance and I'm also going to have a little foray into the worlds of bore and stroke. So sit down and grab yourself a cuppa or something like that and enjoy some riveting YouTube stuff. So this is the engine from the top side with no cylinder head on it. And these are obviously pistons in bores. Now you might go, ooh they're horrible and dirty, I can't believe you put it back together like that. But, here's the point, I have given them a light cleaning just with some scotch brush to take any big loose bits of uh, carbon off them and any large build ups. But they're actually surprisingly clean, you can still see the etchings, you can still actually even see the barcoding on this one. They are cleaner than they really first appear, so that's all my excuses done. So the next thing we can see is, when I turn the crankshaft, you can see the pistons going up and down in the bores. Nice and simple, two go up, two go down, everything's fairly well balanced. What you'll also notice is, these don't actually move very far up and down in the bores. This engine is very over square, and by that we mean that the bore of the piston, the bore of the, bo the bore, well, the bore of the bore, is big compared to the stroke. So these are an 80 mm bore with a 49.7 mm stroke. So that's what we refer to as over square. The next thing we need to consider with an over square engine, or with any engine, is the advantages to either a short stroke like this or a long stroke. So in a longer stroke engine, because the piston is travelling further on each stroke, it's exerting more force on the crankshaft. So that creates more torque because it's twisting the crankshaft further. Makes all sense. The crank pins are further apart, there's more leverage. So long stroke makes more torque. So in a touring bike or in your car, you want a long stroke engine. But, and this is the important bit, almost all engine design is limited by piston speed. So there is a certain speed that the piston can go up and down the bore. Any more than that, the piston will start to come apart, or the conrod will snap, or the crank will break. So, on these with a short stroke, it means the engine can rev a lot higher before we hit the terminal piston speed. That also means that we're getting, although we're getting less torque, we're getting it more often because we're revving higher. So instead of going kadonk, 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 we're going ding, 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 ding on the crankshaft. So we're actually creating more power because we're getting the same torque, well, less torque, but we're getting it much more often. So power is torque how often we get it. Hopefully that makes sense. Also it means we have a bigger piston, uh, bigger valve area in the cylinder head because we can put bigger valves in because the ball's bigger and that gives us a bigger valve area. But we'll do more of that when we get on to cam timing. So I've cleaned up the cylinder head faces here and I've cleaned the ones up on the actual cylinder head. The pistons are clean even if they don't really look it. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the squish. Now the squish is the clearance between sort of the edge areas of the piston and the cylinder head and that's the tightest point that the piston is to the cylinder head and that's quite critical for getting a good clean combustion. So we can't have it too small because then the pressure goes too high and we can get detonation which is bad. And we don't want it too big because then, well, you get less compression. So, the way I'm going to measure the squish is I'm going to lay a piece of solder across the piston four ways. And then I can bolt the cylinder head back on with a gasket in it. I can turn the engine over like this. And that will squeeze the solder. And that will tell me how big the squish clearance is. On these engines, you have to put the cylinder head gasket in because it's quite thick. On a lot of engines, you can actually do the squish measurement without the head gasket, and then calculate it in afterwards. So I'm going to put the old cylinder head gasket back on, bolt the head on, and do a squish measurement. So this is a pretty simple measurement to take. As you can see, I've got my solder stuck on with a bit of blue tack. 
and then all I'm going to do is put the cylinder head back on, uh, tighten the bolts down, turn the engine over and that will squash the uh, solder against the cylinder head, take the head back off again and measure how thick we've squashed the solder. So I've turned the engine over with the solder in and you can see it's flattened that solder there and a bit at the edges as well around here. So what I should do now is I should just pick that off and using my vernier caliper I should just measure the edges and see what the squish value is. So I've measured the squish clearance and it's pretty much exactly what I'd expect from one of these BMW engines. I've done quite a few of them. With it being standard it isn't really strictly necessary to check the squish but you know it's professional curiosity as much as anything to make sure the engines are fairly consistent. What I'm not doing this time is doing piston to valve clearance measurement because I've measured it on quite a few of these BMW engines and now I know the squish is the same I'm sure the piston to valve clearances will be no problem at all. If I was doing a tuned engine I would be checking the piston to valve clearance and how you do that is very similar to what we've just done is you'd put sort of plasticine or clay or something similar on the uh, piston tops you'd then put the cylinder head on put the camshafts in you've actually got to time everything up correctly because also the cam timing alters the piston valve clearance then I'd turn the engine over take the cylinder head off measure the clay or the plasticine and that would give you your piston valve clearance but we don't really need to do that and it's quite time consuming so we're not going to do it this time. The last thing I'm going to mention before I put the cylinder head back on is just what I'm looking for when I inspect the bores. Now you can see in here we've actually got quite a lot of reflection in here but hopefully you can see this very very light um, sort of, I'm trying to get the camera to focus on it, this light graining looks like sort of scratching almost cross hatching on the cylinder wall and that is supposed to be there. If you had a cylinder wall that was actually perfectly polished, um, then what would actually happen was the, the piston rings would actually float on the oil that would sit on a perfectly polished surface. So the idea of the hatching on here is that it holds a minutest amount of oil so the piston rings can actually get lubrication from the oil without floating in the bore. Because if they start floating, then you get too much oil passing and then that's no good for your engine. So you have to have a little bit of this hatching. You can uh, re-hone them with a ball hone, which is quite a specialist piece of kit, but these are in really good condition, so there is no need to do it. Obviously, if there's any marking in here, anything that sort of that you could feel with your fingernail, um, any dents if it's dropped a valve previously or anything like that, that is no good. So the balls want to be in very good, clean condition, but expect to see a little bit of hatching because that's how they're supposed to be. So now we've done that, I've re-cleaned the faces, I've re-cleaned the cylinder head, so I can put the head gasket on, a new head gasket, and uh, put the cylinder head on. That's all the cylinder head bolts refitted now, and torqued up. These are torqued to a torque setting and then a rotation, an angle setting, so they're in their elastic region. Um, and interestingly, the torque setting, uh, in fact the angle setting, has actually changed uh, over the years. So it's always worth having the most up-to-date information you can when you're putting an engine together. So now that that's all tight, the next thing to do is refit the cam chain tensioners into here fit the cam chain and I can put the camshafts back in. So in preparation for getting the cams in place I've set the timing marks together, I've installed the crank locking pin which is a special tool from BMW and I've then got the cams just resting in the head with the timing marks basically lined up and I've got it if I poke my finger in the hole for the cam chain tensioner got it so it's sitting about right. So now, before I put the caps on, I've just got to replace all the O-rings. In there, I've put a bit of oil on all the journals. So I shall put the cam caps back on and tighten them down. The thing to remember when putting the cam caps on is to make sure you've got the right one in the right place, which on some engines is actually very easy to get wrong, and then just to torque them down nice and evenly so they pull down flat and don't just pull down at weird angles. So I shall tighten all that down, 
put the cam chain tensioner back in and make sure the timing is actually correct. That's the cams all in and torqued up. Uh, the tension is in, so the cam chain is now tight. The tension on these just goes in the front and it's, it's sprung loaded, so it pushes against the cam chain tensioning blades and just holds tension on the, uh, on the cam chain. And it's also got an oil feed into it as well, which is pretty common nowadays. So, I've taken the uh, crank pin out and I've done a rotation of the crank. I've realigned the um, timing marks, put the uh, retaining pin back in, and I'm just going to check the uh, timing. So, look at that, perfect, straight away. So that is excellent news. That means everything's sat in the right place. Now I'm going to do uh, the valve clearances again. I checked them on the way down, but it's always worth double checking everything because we'd be silly if we got something wrong at this stage. Yeah. This would seem as good a time as any to talk about cam timing and its importance in making an engine fast. So the basics of it is, you want your inlet cam to push the inlet valve open while the piston is going down on the suck stroke of the suck squeeze bang blow. With me so far? With opening the valve it allows the piston to suck the fuel and air charge through the inlet port into the cylinder. Then ideally, as soon as you've got the piston at the bottom, you would close the valve and the piston would come up, compress the mixture, big bang, push it down, the inlet valve would then instantly open, you'd push your exhaust gas out, and your valve would instantly close. But of course, it isn't that simple. Because you can't just instantly open or close a valve, that brings us to a bit of a problem, and builds in quite a lot of compromise. So, what happens is, to get the most power out of an engine, you need to actually have the inlet valve and, to an extent, the exhaust valve open, for as long as possible during the stroke that is important to that valve. Are you with me? I told you this was going to get complicated. So, if you had too big a ramp on your cam, you would open the valve too fast, and then when you wanted the valve to stop, it wouldn't, it would just carry on because it would have too much momentum. So you need a softer ramp on the cam, so you have to open it a little bit slower. So the problem with this is, of course, you can't have it fully open for as long. So to get round that, what tends to happen is the valve starts opening before the piston starts to go down. So in fact, on the exhaust stroke, when the piston is coming back up and pushing the fumes out of the exhaust, the inlet valve has actually started to open already. So obviously at this point, we're getting some of the exhaust fumes back up the inlet. Not a lot, but a tiny little bit. Now this is where exhaust design comes in, because the pressure pulses in the exhaust, if you time it well, will, in the exhaust part, create reverse gas harmonics, what people call back pressure, and that will pull the next bit of exhaust gas out, so your charge will stay clean. Are you still with me? Are you asleep? Right. So, we've, uh, we've anticipated that we're going to have the inlet valve open slightly before the valve starts, the piston starts going back down the ball on the suction stroke. When it gets to the bottom of the stroke, the obviously you want to close the valve, but again, you can't just close it instantly. It doesn't work like that, because if you let go of the valve, it'd smash into the seat with the pressure of the valve spring, and you'd snap the end off the valve. So you have to close the valve quite slowly and gradually and ease it back onto the seat. So, this is a bit an interesting bit as well. When the engine is revving at high RPM, there's lots and lots of gas speed. This, the gases in here, the air and fuel going in, will be nearly supersonic velocity. So in fact, when the piston starts going back up on the compression stroke, having the valve slightly open can actually overfill the cylinder because there's so much momentum, it drags more fuel and air in. So, even though you've got a 250cc cylinder, you might actually get more than 250cc of gas in it. But, again with compromise, at low RPM, when you don't have the gas speed, pushing when the piston starts coming back up, it'll push some of the charge back out of the inlet. So it's not very efficient, and of course it's not ideally clean. 
So that's sort of your inlet stroke. You've got a compromise between loads and loads of power at top end and having the engine working efficiently at the bottom end. Now, the exhaust valve is basically the same. You've got to open it before it's really strictly needed so that you've got time to get it wide open. Then, of course, on the way back after the exhaust stroke, you've got to have a little bit of time to get it closed again. So, at times, you have both the inlet and the exhaust valves open at the same time, and this is what we call valve overlap. <sighs> Are we still going? Right, valve overlap. Back when camshafts you had one for an engine, you couldn't alter the valve overlap. It was fixed. But with double overhead cams like these, I can alter the timing of the cams independently with altering the gears that are on the ends of here. And that means I can alter how much valve overlap I have. But obviously I can only alter it when I'm building the engine, not when it's running. So an engine with lots and lots of valve overlap tends to make better at high RPM, but will be less efficient, worse on emissions, and generally make less power at the bottom end of the RPM range because the cams are only really perfectly in tune with each other at one RPM range. With me? So this compromise with valve overlap and valve duration. This is where variable valve timing comes in. What you tend to have on variable valve timing is two sets of inlet cams, uh, cam, cam lobes, and it swaps between the two while the engine's running. Now this is ideal because you can have no valve overlap at low RPM, so you get nice clean emissions, good bottom end power, and then when the engine's revving a bit more, you move on to your lumpy cams, more overlap, better power at high RPM. But of course, it's more expensive, it's more difficult to engineer, it's heavier, you know, it's a compromise. So that has covered most of the very, very basics of valve timing. There is a whole world of research and development and learning on this and it's so incredibly complicated to get it right a lot of the time it's just play around and see or even better stick with what the manufacturer recommends so now we've talked about it what i'm going to do is put the spark plugs back in put the cover on and forget about it now that the top end's all buttoned up all I've got to do now really is put the side covers and the sump and bits back on it. So I'm going to have a bit of a tea break and uh, I'll see you in a bit. Thanks for watching. I hope you're still awake and join us again next time for the final instalment.